All right. So um, basically what we've been uh, through, the PDFs we've been through right now, uh, we've shown the access spacing, distance from intersections and interchanges, and the MTO permit control area. And uh, with that, I'll move into the uh, next uh, chat, which is MTO TIS guidelines, which actually as well, like uh, all of the guidelines that we use work in well, and complement each other. And this guideline is well complemented by uh, the uh, access management guidelines. So with that, the main purpose of a traffic impact study is to identify the impact for proposed development or a redevelopment, um, similar to how we described it the last time in last lecture, and how the impacts can be mitigated or addressed in a manner that is consistent with the objectives of the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, usually, um, you can um, find, well, before starting any study that involves MTO, uh, you can actually look into MTO TIS guidelines by simply just searching MTO TIS guidelines in Google, or uh, the same thing, basically, um, that same link that uh, we have searched for in the uh, Highway Corridor Management you'll be able to find the TIS guidelines as well here, which is here, this link, MTO Traffic Impact Study Guidelines. But regardless, both ways, no matter how you search for it, um, you can find it. There are two versions though, so be careful while searching for those. So the first link um, is showing a 2008 guidelines. They are not significantly different from the uh, 2014 guidelines that I'll be showing you. Uh, it's just that this guideline is only involving the uh, technical uh, steps very concise. Um, MTO did publish more detailed guidelines in 2014, and that's why I wanted to say be careful when you search for it. The 2014 is the latest guideline, and you can find that in your second link if you're just Google searching. Um, once you open it, similar to the high recorder management guidelines or manual, you click it. Um, you'll be able to find the TIS guidelines. Similar to how we described TIS guidelines, the TIS guidelines really um, give a way forward or a set of rules and tools to actually use during the course of a traffic study. Uh, the purpose is to assess the uh, consultants to be always consistent with what they're doing in terms of work and technical parameters, but at the same time, to be able to uh, get to mitigation measures and assessments that are reasonable and representative of the uh, condition in the problem. So um, you'll find a, a quick description of um, uh, traffic impacts, uh, what has been updated since the previous guideline, nothing much really. Um, typically, TISs are considered valid as long as they are within three years of the date of their uh, submission uh, with at least MTO. And MTO does as well provide a description of uh, traffic impact or study brief letters, which uh, from last lecture, you know, when the uh, traps generated are not high enough to warrant a traffic study, um, it, you can, a, a traffic letter or a trip generation letter or a traffic brief um, can suffice. Um, typical table of content, the uh, guidelines will talk about the submission. That Apologies for that, I got kicked out for some reason. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Okay, so the, the guidelines will talk about the submission requirements, the how the study should look like um, in terms of layout. That as well facilitates uh, MTO's review. So there is a standard uh, 
progression of how the TIA is going to lay out the information over the details of the analysis. Uh, what needs to be done at different sections and uh, in analyzing um, like uh, generated traffic of a development, uh, what is considered as a critical peak, when to consider improvements and stuff like that, are things or answers that will be detailed in a traffic impact study uh, assessment guideline or a traffic impact study guideline such as this one. So moving on, um, quick bit of a, a description of how the TIA, uh, introduction of, of the guidelines, of course. Um, what are these guidelines addressing the different aspects? MTO contact information. So before getting into, um, well, in, in, to be able to engage MTO, you will need to connect with those staff. So uh, if your study is happening in the um, Western region of Ontario, you will call a specific number and that's the office uh, of the Western region. They will direct you to the appropriate staff. However, I typically don't use the uh, PDF numbers here. What I would recommend is actually getting these from numbers in the future whenever you are involved in a study um, from the actual um, contacts in the same uh, section where you can find resources as well. So you'll find the central region's uh, contact details because the websites are typically updated regularly, but sometimes um, the PDF documents and guidelines get missed. And I got into a situation one time where I did contact one of the numbers and I ended up getting connected to a different region. So this is really why I'm mentioning it's better to get your uh, contact information from uh, the website. As well, details uh, what MTO will accept in terms of analysis software and, and uh, analysis uh, methodologies as well. Details on the submission requirements, what needs to be included in the study, um, and all the same stuff, actually, let's go through them. This is the same stuff that we went through uh, previously, an executive summary containing the key findings of the, uh, of, the, of the study, what is the study, basically, uh, what has been analyzed, what are the findings, and uh, are they acceptable or not. Um, an introduction, introducing your development, um, or what you're doing in the study, the description or analysis of existing conditions. So we have a baseline, description of the study area, a description of the development plan use and site uh, plan. So you can generate the um, development or generate thread generations um, or generate the traffic that will be uh, added to the network because of this development and be able to add it on top of your background network, which is derived from existing uh, conditions analysis. If your development is happening across stages, you'll have to divide your horizon years of analysis to these stages. Um, if there are planned improvements, every jurisdiction, not necessarily MTO, but uh, MTO or Ottawa, according based using their uh, long-term, long-range uh, plan uh, or master plan, they do have plans that will go out in the future. So for example, in the city of Ottawa, you know that, okay, by the year 2031, I will have a four, uh, or let's say an extension of light rail transit. Uh, by the year 2031, I'll have a new belt in this area and so on and so forth. MTO, through engaging with MTO, MTO will let you know if they have planned projects within the vicinity of the area. You also need to do your own uh, background research as well. Uh, prior to contacting MTO. A lot of these can be found in counties' websites or um, the uh, cities and small towns or townships' websites. Study horizons. So typically with MTO studies, any development that comes in, you need to analyze existing condition. You need to analyze the year that this uh, development is going to be operational and any staging, major staging with them. If the, if the development is going to be built on two stages, stage one uh, by 2025 and stage two by 2030. So that becomes two new horizon years that get added to your study. Part of the requirements of MTO is not just to analyze conditions when the site is operational and fully built, but also to analyze conditions five years and 10 years far into the future. Most of the jurisdictions deal with five years into the future, at least, well, uh, at least the jurisdiction I've seen with Kingston and the city of Ottawa. Um, in terms, I know in the West, things are done slightly differently. They do have their own 
um, long-term uh, range model, and they give you the horizon years, depending on the city or, or the location. Static analyses, uh, what needs to be analyzed? Uh, you need to analyze A and peak hour period, uh, or peak hour and the P and peak hour as well. Uh, is the site special enough to have its own peak hour that is different from the roadway and is maybe um, uh, or may lead to a condition that are similar to the AM and, AM and PM peak hours? If that's the case, you need to analyze that um, peak as well. For example, if you are um, dealing with a religious establishment, you need to analyze that religious establishment, establishment peak hour at itself. If it's, for example, a church, or a mosque or something else, it can be um, either a, a Saturday peak or a, a Friday afternoon peak or a Saturday or a Sunday peak. That that can work. Or you'll need to you'll need to include all um, the, the uh, peak hours, AM and PM, because we know our roadways experience the peaks during these times. But as the generators or developments, uh, peak hour is different. You need to analyze that separately as well. Um, on top of that, you, um, the study would highlight um, what you will need to uh, add in in terms of uh, traffic conditions, plus background growth, uh, growth um, and then you need to add on top of it the side generated traffic and so on and so forth. The, the very basic nature of or progression of how we uh, typically add on the different horizon years or different scenarios that we analyze across the different years of development. MTO will give you as well where you can find data. They have um, a set of uh, average annual daily traffic um, uh, data um, and uh, counts, uh, and they uh, give you a link for these as well. You can uh, request the detailed intersection counts from MTO itself or through the person or the stand that you will get connected to after you reach out to the MTO. The very basic background analysis, as we mentioned, trip generation, distribution, typically uh, is basically how you are going to distribute those traffic volumes that will be generated by the development. And typically we um, use existing um, traffic patterns to assign them how much is going east, 50% of my traffic is going east, maybe 40% is going west, 5% north and 5% south. That, that depends on the data that we typically uh, establish or capture from the existing um, traffic data collection and that we use for unloading this condition. I'm not going to dive much in, uh, more uh, in, in detail in terms of pass by internal capture, but uh, because we will be dealing with this in more detail later on uh, when we get to the Ottawa modules. But basically, pass by traps are traps that are in nature are not new traps to a development. For example, if you do have a gas station, that gas station may have, let's say, 20 traps distant to the gas station itself. But additionally, maybe a part of those traps uh, have been traps that are background traffic across the road. They are driving this roadway every single day, regardless of their passing by. And they will be not necessarily generated because there is a gas station. No, it's really because it's just it's there on the way. So this is traffic that will have to be subtracted from the traps that you generate, assign them to enter that gas station, and assign them back to exit the gas station again. So that's typically what's referred to, to uh, what's referred to in terms of pass by traps. When you get to internal capture. If you have a mixed use development and that development has a mixture of uh, residential uh, uses, commercial, retail, um, offices, um, entertainment, some of the traps, the development is likely going to be large enough to allow for some of the residents to actually do internal traps by walking without even using a car. So there are reductions that we um, do to come up with the internal capture rate. It's referred to internal capture rate of reduction. We're not going to dive into this. There is a whole lot of, uh, there's a detailed kind of spreadsheet to kind of leave that and a, a detailed report and we'll get to it by next lecture, hopefully. But don't worry about this aspect uh, for now. Uh, and as well, uh, the, other thing I want to highlight is MTO's definition of what is critical to require improvement. 
and uh, mainly into the definition of critical is at signalized intersection, movements with a volume to capacity ratio more than 0.85, these are critical, and we should look into improvements for these. And what I mean by volume to capacity is basically, think of it as a demand to capacity function. For every movement, there is a specific demand, let's say 500 cars, and there is a capacity. Let's say that lane can accommodate 1,000 cars. So your demand capacity, we think about it from very simple terms as really demand over supply. So this number, in theory, should not exceed one, but it does. So when, when we deal with um, analysis software, uh, when the volume capacity is greater than one, there are uh, meanings for what that is supposed to mean. Um, it, it, in some cases, a volume capacity greater than one, uh, but with a delay that is, let's say, 50 or 60 seconds may mean that the queuing is not going to be likely uh, the same as what the software is telling you. But anyways, do not worry about exceeding one for now. Uh, generally, it's a value between zero to one. It's a demand over supply. The greater you get closer to one, the more demand or uh, the more saturated that approach link is, and that's when you start to look into improvements.